welcome to the Polygamer Podcast, where gaming is for everyone. Join us as we expand the boundaries of the gaming community. On this week's episode... Look, you can do it with zero experience if you really are driven and you really want to do it. It's not that hard. I mean, all you have to do is find a compelling topic and ask the right questions and talk to people. That's Lorian Green, filmmaker, documentarian, gamer, parent, introvert, and more. Lorian first landed on my radar about five years ago when she was producing a documentary called Going Cardboard, all about the rise in popularity of board games. She is now working on a second documentary called Shoot Again, The Resurgence of Pinball. I'm your host, Ken Gagney, and I'll be speaking with Lorian about these topics and more in this episode of Polygamer. But wait, you say, Ken, this is Polygamer. You're supposed to be addressing hard-hitting issues of equality and diversity in gaming. That's true, and we've addressed many such issues in previous episodes of Polygamer, such as when we interviewed Dwayne DeFore about toxic masculinity, or back in November when we talked with Susan Arndt and Russ Pitts about Take This, a nonprofit that helps gamers with mental health issues. And while there remain many issues for Polygamer to address, I also want this show to highlight the good that is being done in the community, especially by marginalized voices. This is something that the Less Than or Equal podcast is excellent at, and we've been doing a little bit of it ourselves on Polygamer. You may recall a previous episode of this show when Hadija Marenkov interviewed Sarah Wilson about her YouTube channel. While we did discuss the popular acceptance of body modification and other such issues, that was primarily an opportunity for us to share with you the great work that Sarah is doing. You don't always need to dedicate your work specifically to addressing issues of equality and diversity. Sometimes just by being you and by being awesome, you're advancing those very causes. That's why we interviewed Ryan Green and Josh Larson on this show about That Dragon Cancer, an indie game that ostensibly would have been a better fit for my other podcast, Indie Cider, but given the nature of the game and how unusual it is and the issues that it addresses, I thought would be a good fit for this show. So while Lorian and I will be discussing issues of equality and diversity, such as her experiences with online gaming or with being an introvert in an extroverted world, there is so much more to her than just fitting a demographic or facing an issue. And I want us to remember that, too. This is actually the second time I've interviewed Lorian. The first time was last August for one of my other podcasts, The Pubcast, which is all about online and electronic publishing. Lorian's day job is as an inbound marketing manager, and I talked with her about how she manages more than three dozen Facebook pages at her day job. If you would like to hear that interview, there is a link in the show notes at polygamer.net, where you can also find other episodes of Polygamer, links to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn, where you are welcome to leave a review, subscribe to our email newsletter, or send feedback by clicking on the contact button or directly emailing feedback at polygamer.net. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first episode of Polygamer for 2015. Happy New Year, and I look forward to bringing you many more fascinating interviews in the months to come. Join me on the line today is my good friend, documentarian, gamer, parent, social media maven, Lorian Green. Hello, Lorian. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you, too. It's cold. <laughs> Yeah, that some things don't change no matter what year it is here in New England. Yes, it's it's nice to be able to rely on that. <laughs> so a little bit of background before we get started. About three years ago, I attended a board game convention in Mansfield, Massachusetts called Total Con, short for Total Confusion. I didn't go there to play the board games. I went there because there was a screening of a documentary I'd heard about on Kickstarter called Going Cardboard, all about the resurgence in popularity of board games. I went to this event, and the director happened to be in the audience, and that director was you, and we've been friends ever since. I did not know you were at that event. That's fabulous. Oh, wait, yeah, I think I remember. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, it was, hey, what's up? That was, it was so long ago. I, the biggest thing I remember about that event was how one of the main players in the documentary was also in the audience, and uh, his story is a big part of the documentary, and at the end, when the conclusion to his story happened without you know, spoiling it. Everybody in the audience applauded and cheered, and I just felt so good for him right then. And that was my favorite moment uh, in that screening. Yay, happy ending. Yeah. So what got you interested, not just in board games, but in producing an entire documentary about them? Oh, uh, well, it was a long saga, I guess. When I was growing up, I was a huge fan of that Civil War documentary by Ken Burns. And this was back in the VHS, you know, era, and the only way to get that documentary, other than watching it on TV, was to do one of those fundraiser things, and it was hundreds of dollars, so I never got it. 
But eventually it came out on DVD and I had a copy and that just sort of really got me into documentaries. And then my husband just randomly once, I think on Netflix, found The King of Kong, which is a documentary about classic arcade gaming. And that just blew my mind. And the big thing about that is I realized there were documentaries about, you know, hobbies that I cared about, not just lofty, you know, educational historical documentaries. So I was first a documentary fan. So I was into that. I was blogging about them, like all the little ones that I could find, like about, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. And again, my husband was just getting into board games. He found this group uh, a little ways north of us that... I think they were called the 3 a.m. gamers, and uh, he joined that group, and he was just coming home late at night, you know, after these long sessions of board gaming, and it was just weird to me. But that was about the time we discovered Settlers of Catan and those kind of games, which are at the time were called German-style games because most of them were made in Germany. And I was just struck by how beautiful they were, you know, and how different they were from the board games that we'd grown up with. So... It was sort of because I was already into these indie documentaries, but I figured that that would be a good subject for a documentary. Basically, I was waiting and Googling and trying to find somebody making one of those, and there just wasn't. And eventually I was just like, you know, I could take a stab at it since there isn't one. Why not? Because this group, the, uh, the gamers group that he was going to had somebody who was involved in covering these games and seemed very knowledgeable about them. Eric Martin was his name. And so he was a friend of ours. And I knew if I wanted to try to make this film, he would be good to advise me on, you know, the important things and so forth. So I just one night just decided to tackle it and give it a shot. And, you know, it worked out. (laughs) What was your history with filmmaking and video production leading up to that? On your LinkedIn profile, you list yourself as a documentary filmmaker with TCAT Productions starting in 2009, which is about when Going Cardboard started. Did you have any experience before that? Absolutely zero. It was absolutely a zero to 60 situation. So in February 2009 was the first kind of film outing that I did for the film. It was uh, a Unity Games, a convention that's in Massachusetts, and you know several of the interviews... Uh, that I got there. Many of them you can see in the film. But that was my first time doing interviews. My brother was kind of in film, so he was helping me do the grips type stuff, which was very good because I really didn't know, you know, where to set the camera and all that stuff as much as I do now. But so that was the first time filming. And the first time I ever made a YouTube video was a compilation of that footage, like a little music video I did. So I had never even made a YouTube video before this, so I had zero experience, which I guess, you know, I would say to people, look, you can do it with zero experience if you really are driven and you really want to do it. It's not that hard. I mean, all you have to do is find a compelling topic and ask the right questions and talk to people. And I did have a couple books that I read that helped me prep for that. But, you know, once you get into editing and stuff, it's just a lot of fun. I guess I just really enjoyed it. So that helped me, you know, overcome the fact that I was a total noob. But editing, from what I understand, can be one of the hardest parts because you end up with hundreds of hours of footage that you need to cull down into just one or two hours. How did you make those decisions? Yeah, that can be really difficult. One of the things that really helped me do that was a book called Documentary Storytelling. Uh, I forget who the author is, but it really discussed like the three act form in classical like storytelling and, you know, to make an outline. And and you wouldn't necessarily think that ahead of time. You're like, oh, it's a documentary. You're not writing it. You're not making up a story. The story's there already. You're covering it. But you are telling a story. You're telling a story about something that's real. That's all. You still do need to stick to that format. It helps package the story in a way that the audience is used to consuming like for hundreds of years, you know, back in Shakespeare's time. So it's a very classical format. And that really helped me kind of write the outline for the film. So I knew the basically I targeted given the questions that I knew would contribute to that outline with the caveat that obviously like as things progress and you know maybe things you didn't expect happen that you can kind of roll with it and add in different things and whatever. But starting with a solid kind of outline of how you want the film to be really helps. That said, as a noob, I definitely took more footage than I necessarily needed to. So that did make it a long process, but I think having, you know, kind of a disciplined transcript of everything, at least a summary of what people are saying at what times, uh, really helped because like when I wanted to do the section about Monopoly, 
I just like went through my huge document that I had kind of compiled everything and Googled, well, not Googled, but, you know, keyword searched for Monopoly. And that helped me gather together anytime anyone was talking about that and decide which pieces I wanted to use or not use. Were there any surprises along the way? You did a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter, which was completed on April 24th of 2011. You raised 337% of what you were expecting. Were you able to deliver to your backers the documentary when you expected you would? Yeah, I think so, because I, I was kind of prepared for that. The average documentary, the stat is, takes four years to do. And I think I did mine in three, but I was aware that it's not as fast as you think it's going to be, you know. And and the big thing I did with my Kickstarter was keep people informed and let them know about the progress and how I was doing and also set the expectation, you know, it's going to probably take a year from now, you know, before you see it. You know, it's in process. It's at this spot, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I was properly intimidated by that editing phase because, you know, getting the film footage, you know, as you kind of alluded to, is sort of the easy part, but editing, it can be painful. So like my first, you know, editing thing where I made that little kind of music video for Unity Games, that was a good cutting my teeth kind of practice. But that was like, you know, a three minute video. When you're talking an hour, you know, plus long film, that's where editing does start to be very, very difficult. But I also had a mentor at the time to help me. So Jason Scott, who's done a lot of other, you know, classic gaming type uh, documentaries, was very, very uh, instrumental in that situation because he knows how to, like, you know, cut the stuff that maybe it would be hard for me to hold on to or, you know, to let go of because, you know, I'm enamored with a certain, you know, oh, I love when they said this or that, but for the strength of the actual film storyline, it has to go. So, you know, that's the best thing. If you're doing it 100% solo, it's really hard because you'll get your own personal feelings involved and kind of, you know, want to do things that maybe aren't the best for the film, it's always good to have another voice to kind of help you, you know, be more objective. And finally, it got to the point where you were able to debut this documentary at events like PAX East and also at MIT. What was the reception like? Oh, that was so exciting. So the first debut was at MIT. It was part of a little games festival thing they were doing, like a video game film festival. And that was just an awesome, awesome night. You know, I mean... I, I applied to MIT when I was, you know, applying for colleges. I've always admired them. They're they're fantastic. They actually have a really cool game science division that they have now that I didn't know about at the time. But I've always admired MIT, and it was really cool for that to be the first place that anybody saw the film. Now, it wasn't completely finished at that point, but that was, you know, where we got the biggest, you know, public exposure and kind of some feedback that kind of helped us tinker it a little bit but yeah the MIT thing was really cool the PAX thing was phenomenal because you know just having a room at PAX and like that room had you know a probably close to 200 people I'm not sure what the actual count was but it was so exciting and they were laughing at all the right places and so the reception at both of those was really good so that was encouraging because obviously you know we're working on this thing and maybe it's great in our heads but you never know like how the public's going to react but again it was a hobby I knew was growing, and I knew there was a lot of love behind it. And it was the first documentary about it, so I was pretty confident that it was going to work out. But it, it's really nice once it hits public to get a positive reception. And now that it's been almost three years since its debut, is this documentary still available? Are you still supporting it or marketing it? I'm not marketing it as much as I probably should be. I've actually got three bonus clips that wouldn't fit on the DVD, and I keep meaning to post them just to the YouTube channel, you know, and maybe as a little teaser type thing, but also just to get it out there because I had them finished. They're good little bonus clips, but I haven't gotten around to that. But as far as supporting the film and still selling it, yes, um, it's available on the website. It's available on Amazon. You can get it digitally through like the Google Play store. You know, I think iTunes still, yeah, iTunes has it you know, and some other sources like that. So you can get digitally or physically. I've always been a bigger fan of the physical copy because, well, in my case, I partnered with Reiner Knizia. He's a very prolific uh, board game designer, and he made a mini game, and I worked with an artist friend of mine to make the board for it. So the DVD actually comes with a little mini board game with little pieces and a, and a little set of cards. So it's really cool. But it also has all those bonus clips that you don't get if you just stream the feature film itself. And those bonus clips, I'm as proud of those as I am of the film itself, because there's some just incredible stuff in there. 
How long before the DVD is sold out? Will there be another run? Uh, there will probably not be another run, partly because I have the digital to fall back on so people can still get it. But, you know, like I said, there will be, I guess it's sort of a collector's item at that point um, because it, it costs an, several thousand dollars to do a DVD run and then you have to get like 3,000 copies, you know, or whatever of the DVD again. And I have enough copies that I think I can you know take care of the demand for a while but yeah i mean it's it's definitely finite you know like there aren't i don't know how many more copies i have i've got a few boxes down in the basement but you know i would say maybe 300 in addition to those bonus clips you also mentioned jason scott who with his documentaries get lamp and bbs he uploaded the hundreds of hours of raw unedited interviews to the internet archive do you have any plans to release your footage which i assume you still have archived somewhere i do it's on it's on two big external hard drives that i named um deadpool and venom i have a little stickers i stole from my son that, on each one of those but um i i don't know if i would do that because like i said as an amateur i meandered i would like let them just talk you know and each one of those interviews is over an hour so I don't know how interesting it would be. There's certainly stuff in them. What I would probably do if I did something like that is compile like interesting pieces together that hadn't made the movie or hadn't made the bonus clips and, you know, probably have them in rougher form than a finished bonus clip. But I think I'd probably try to cobble them together to a more cohesive final piece and put that up. But like I said, I've already got these three clips that I should, you know, get off my butt and put up to begin with. So... It, it has to start there, I would say, but I don't think I'd ever release all the raw footage. No, I can appreciate that. I'm not a documentarian, but as a podcaster, my guests often expect or even require that I edit our interviews because we all want to sound as smart as we can, and that isn't always possible on a first take. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, people say things that just aren't relevant or people say things, you know, that maybe they regret saying, you know, about another person, you know, and it, it really, as a documentarian, they're putting their trust in you to kind of protect them from themselves in that sense. So, you know, there, there's that element of it, too. Now, during the entire production of this film, you weren't just a documentarian. You were also a gamer. You had an entire room of your house dedicated just to board games. Yes, we did. We had a giant table in the basement and, like, a huge, huge... Pu Not as big a collection as some, like you'll see in the film. Like, we had kind of an average size collection for what uh what these guys are into but yeah we had plenty of games and what happened to all those games when the filming was done well we still have them um uh, as things developed we actually got rid of the big gamer table downstairs because we needed to replace it with pinball machines we still have most of those games the thing we don't have as much as the time uh you know a lot of the friends that we would game with you know had kids of their own we had kids and it, it's harder, like, to schedule that time to get together. And the thing about most of these board games is they're, they take a lot of concentration. And so, you know, when you, when you have kids, there's a, there's a window of time where you really can't, um, effectively play these games. However, you know, once they get to be, you know, nine, 10, or even a little bit sooner, you can start to loop them in and then you have sort of, the built-in group that you can game with, you know, in your own house, which is awesome. And we're starting to get to that point now. So we've started taking out the games, you know, they, it's not like they expire. So they've been sitting there, you know, and we've started to take them out. Like the kids have played Ave Caesar with us and they really liked it. You know, there's a Lord of the Rings uh, living card game that my husband's been playing with my son. So we're getting back into it, but there is that window of time where they're just too young. So in the meantime, your board game room has turned into a pinball room. Yes, it has. How does one get into that? Because I had a single pinball table in my house when I was a kid growing up, and it just seemed like it was difficult to acquire, to move into the house, to maintain. And yet there you are with, what, a dozen tables you have now? Yeah, that was our max. We're, we're at like eight, I think, right now. But you know, and that may sound ridiculous, but it is one of those things where you start getting into it, it becomes easier and easier. And then you just, you know, get into the situation. And there are hundreds of awesome tables out there. But how we got into it was, um, so similarly to how I got into the board game thing, 
I was watching documentaries about pinball and Tilt the Battle to Save Pinball has always been one of my favorite documentaries. Even though growing up, I really wasn't aware of pinball. Like pinball wasn't a thing with me. I was more into like classic arcade games, you know, like Pitfall and stuff like that. In the 90s, there was um, an arcade type place called Good Times in Somerville, Mass. And when I was first dating my husband, we would go there a lot. And there was this Theodore Magic pinball machine. And I think that was sort of a gateway pinball for a lot of people. Uh, it was just gorgeous. The theme's really cool. And it's the DMD era pinball. So when we were kids, you know, pinball was, they call it EM pinball. It's, you know, it doesn't have the screen with the electronic stuff in like video mode and so forth. It, it just was sort of, it would count the points and it was less interesting. In the 90s was when that DMD era happened. And that was sort of a second golden age for pinball. But that ended and um, pinball, you, as you know, kind of disappeared from view. But there were a lot of those tables, like the DMD tables, and the collector market really heated up at that point. So they didn't destroy them all. They were out there, just, you know, not in arcades anymore. So people were owning those in private collections. And, you know, then the internet came along, and people were able to group together, you know, even if they weren't geographically located, and talk about this hobby. And like you said, it takes a lot of tinkering, it takes a lot of know-how. But when you have the situation where people can kind of crowdsource that knowledge, and ask each other questions and get help, that just changed everything. So then that market started to heat up. And um, it was basically we were watching a documentary called Special When Lit. And we're just sitting there one night watching it. And my husband's like, well, what pinball machine would you want to own if we owned one? And he knew it was a loaded question because I, for years, I'd been like, oh, we should get a pinball machine. We should get an arcade machine. We should have all this stuff in the basement. So, you know, he knew that I would jump at that, you know, like a fish to bait. But I was just like, oh, you know, Lord of the Rings. And so we were looking for that. But our first pinball machine wound up being the Shadow, which I partly funded from um, the profits from the Going Cardboard documentary, which was fitting since it didn't take long, you know, as you can imagine, for me to be like, oh, there should be a documentary about this pinball resurgence. Like, someone should do that. You know, so one thing leads to another. But again, just like with making documentaries, you didn't have any prior knowledge going in. And with pinball tables, as I understand it, there are miles of cabling underneath the hood. How do you learn how to maintain such a complex piece of equipment? Yeah, it's extremely complex. Like, having some skills in soldering helps. Basically, we were lucky because there is a pinball arcade like 20 minutes away from us. And that's extremely unusual, you know, in this day and age, but becoming less unusual. But the person who owned it used to be an operator and she makes house calls. So, um, you know, we had that to fall back on if we really needed to. But once we started getting into the community, it's just learn as you go. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't the primary one doing the fixing. My husband's the one that's into that. He, you know, if like an opto switch breaks or something, he knows how to do it. And I know how to do some of the things, but, you know, it was mainly he found that he just really had an affinity for it and he liked it. And you really do have to be into that kind of thing. You know, like people who work on classic cars, if you're into it, if that's your kind of thing, then it's exciting and it's cool and you just, you want to learn that stuff. So we were lucky because he was into the tinkering, but when we first got them, yeah, we were hugely intimidated my biggest thing was like, oh my God, you have to wax the play field. Like, what is that? That's like the most simple, basic, possible tip of the iceberg thing, you know, in hindsight, like we know that now, but that seemed crazy to me because, you know, with classic arcade games, like, you know, a Donkey Kong machine, there's none of that because there isn't the physical component. So they're much easier to maintain, but there's just something about pinball. It's super fun. What's been one of the most complex pinball tables you've owned? I have to think about that. I guess Star Trek The Next Generation, it's pretty complex because it has, you know, the cannons that fire the pinball. And, you know, you can have issues with those, with the motors. Um, it's got subways. Like, it's got this big, intricate subway that when we first got it to, to um, we were doing the cleanup shopping it is what they call it. Just getting that out from under the pinball machine, like, so I could clean it was epic. So, yeah, that one's got a lot of parts and a lot of stuff that can go wrong. Um, it's also a wide body, so it's that much bigger. 
Now, your inventory is constantly rotating. You'll get bored with one machine and swap it out for another. How long do you tend to hold on to a machine and where do you get the new ones? Well, so we have like a go-to guy that lives in Connecticut that we do most of our used pinball machine business with. Um, but, you know, Stern Pinball and now Jersey Jack Pinball and some other boutique places are still making new pinball machines. And a lot of people maybe don't know that, you know, but like we bought our ACDC pinball machine brand new from them. It was in the box, you know, shipped to our house. So, and those are expensive. Whereas, you know, with the secondary market, with the used ones, you can get better deals. Like that's probably, you know, it's, it's pros and cons. You can get a better deal on that, but it's going to probably require more maintenance. It might have more things wrong with it. They have a history because they're used. They're from the nineties, you know, but all in all, they're sturdy machines. They're built for you know, commercial use, they're built for whatever, you know, you can deal to them. Home use for them is like, you know, retiring on an island. So, but we get, and that's the thing, when you first start with pinball, all the tables are new. There's so much variety. Plus there's the nostalgia factor, you know, there's like Adam's family, like the, for us, the shadow, you know, it's all the stuff that you grew up with in the nineties. You're like, oh, this is so cool. I want to own this. I want to own that. Like we had Judge Dredd. So at first, you know, you have this like flush of like excitement and you're going through all these tables. Like in the first year, I think we owned a total of 25 tables just like that would rotate in and out, you know, like we get one, keep it for a while, maybe six months and then like get another one. We've slowed down now and we, we don't have the shadow anymore, but I think the fourth table we ever bought was Lord of the Rings and we got a really nice one. We still have that. And we'll probably never get rid of it. So at this point, we've slowed down and we have our machines for more like a year. But at first, when you're first into the hobby, my God, it's hard to even... There were times when we'd only have one for like a month and decide, okay, we don't really like it. You know, and then just like swap it out and get something new. There's no reason not to once you are used to doing it. And once you have, you know, like the means and the experience of moving them, because they are heavy. They're like over 300 pounds. But once you're used to setting them up and moving them, that barrier is just gone. You mentioned being rather attached to your Lord of the Rings table. Are, are you named after the Lord of the Rings? Because isn't Lorien oh, a place in Middle Earth? Yes, actually, yeah. Um, my parents were total Tolkien geeks. And from what I am told by my mom, it was going to be either Lorien or Galadriel. And I'm super glad they went with Lorien. But when I was a kid, it was a pain because I was really shy and... You know, the teachers would pronounce it wrong every single year in school, and I'd have to correct them, and I'd turn beet red, you know, and it was just, it was tough then. It's cool now, but it was it was tough growing up with that. So now that you are fully invested in pinball, I understand you are now working on another documentary, as you alluded to earlier. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so like I said, you know, the last documentary about pinball was in, like, 2009, and, you know, it's a cool documentary, but you, the mood of it, is not necessarily optimistic. Like even then, like some of the industry veterans were kind of dubious about like, I don't know if pinball will be around in like 10 years or whatever. Like they, they felt like they could kind of see the end coming. You know, that was 2009. And what we noticed is, you know, come like 2011 or whatever, all these barcades start popping up. Like pinball starts to be cool. People start making mods for pinball machines. Like there's this pinball machine Tron. And I know you saw it, like we used to have it at our house, but it comes with this little tiny replica of the Tron arcade cabinet, like in one part of it. And one of the mods you can get for it is somebody took that little arcade cabinet and took a little, you know, chip or however they did it. They made it so that the main version of Tron, the multiple arcade machine emulator version, actually plays in that thing. So you've got this tiny little Tron arcade machine inside your pinball machine that's actually playing the Tron video arcade game. So, and that's just some family doing that. They actually all pitch in. They're super cool, but that's the kind of mod stuff that's happening. So no pinball documentary has ever even talked about that. And to me, that was like one of the very coolest things about pinball. I'm like, oh my God, you can like change the machines after you buy them. Like who knew that? And the thing is like, yeah, the community knows that people have no idea about that. And I just thought that was cool. So there started to be things like that. Things like, you know, the community... Um, around it using the internet to uh, communicate with each other and growing. And then this Jersey Jack pinball company pops up. They're doing the Wizard of Oz pinball 
And right now they're doing the Hobbit pinball, you know, based on the new Hobbit movies. But it had been years and years and years since any new pinball machine company was on the scene. So that's, that's just one huge sign that like things are changing. So I didn't want the last available documentary about pinball to be this kind of, oh, it's a thing of the past, you know, it's just a little nostalgia niche and it's dying. Like it, it, it isn't, you know, it's so vibrant. There's like crazy big barcades and leagues and it's more alive now than it has been in years and years and years. So I felt like that needed to be documented. So I wanted to do that, but you know, after the going cardboard thing, when I realized what a huge task an actual documentary is, I was kind of like hesitant to do it myself. But at the same time, we were super into the pinball scene. So I was well aware of all the ins and outs. I knew all the topics that it should have. So, you know, I had an outline of what, like I said, you know, this documentary storytelling, I had an outline of what I thought should be covered in a pinball documentary, like a new one, but I just didn't really have the time for it. So then one of the video game websites I follow, it might've been Kotaku, Polygon, I think it was probably, posted this video called Pinball Love, which was basically this really cool video of just like, it was well filmed, it was beautiful, it was like, you know, up in your face, like shots of pinball where you'd see like the ball like first person perspective like going through the machine and it was just like the most beautiful pinball video I've ever seen like it brought tears to my eyes it was just and the music was just great you know it was just perfect so I went to that YouTube channel and I contacted that guy and I said clearly you get pinball I think there should be another pinball documentary you should maybe think about making it And he actually responded to me and he said, I have actually been thinking about that. Like, we should talk. And that was Blake Fawcett. And he did that for uh, his Destructotron channel. That was, I guess the rest was sort of history. You know, I had the the contacts and the outline. And he definitely had the gear and the video skill. So we just partnered on that because it's just, you. like I said, you always need a partner. It really makes these things like so much better. I'm familiar with Blake's work. I saw his work in Super Mario Warfare for Beatdown Boogie. It was excellent. He's so great. And he covers the cosplay community. And that's the that's another thing. Like, a documentary wouldn't even do justice to what people do now with the cosplay stuff. I am so ad- in admiration and awe and just, like, a little bit of jealousy about what people do with cosplay these days. Um, it's just brilliant. So what is the division of labor for... Shoot again, the resurgence of pinball. You are working out with Blake. Is one of you the director, the other is a producer? Blake is the director and producer. I am entitled the associate producer. These lines blur. Like, I'm just like, whatever gets it done. Really, my role was to kind of shape it. I, like I said, I had the outline. I did all the, made all the contacts. I scheduled the interviews. I found the right people. And then he would just kind of go and you know be like on assignment and go and talk to these people and do these i wrote the interview questions and i think for the most part he used them but you know like i said you kind of roll with it so when other stuff would come up he would do it but like when he went to the chicago expo which is the longest running pinball expo in the world and it's still running you know like i made all the contacts with people i was on the phone like sending them up to his hotel room which is kind of cool in this day and age that you know i was here at home but I was totally able to coordinate that for him and make it run smoothly and get everybody, you know, to meet up with him and like, you know, do all the filming because he was actually on site at that expo. So that's sort of how it's worked for us. And it's worked really well. We're pretty much done with the filming. And now we're moving into, you know, he's doing the editing. We're really hoping to get a big chunk of that done this month and get the thing out because it's definitely time. Like so many exciting things are happening in pinball, but um, that's pretty much how it works. What lessons did you learn from going cardboard that you hope to either replicate the successes of and shoot again or mistakes you want to learn from? Well, I think with going cardboard, like I wouldn't call it a mistake, but, you know, I, I mean, I'm proud of that film, but, you know, Blake is a freelance video god. Like he's really, really good. And that's what I had wanted for pinball because it's such a beautiful medium that I'd wanted that. I, I'd wanted somebody who had better gear than me, basically, and, you know, the skills and, you know, like when I saw that pinball love video, like then that's the kind of thing that I wanted pinball to be represented as. And the thing about it is going cardboard, you know, I, and it may still be the only board game documentary that's actually out there. 
I mean, there are some other, you know, like mini documentaries and like small shorts covering board games, but I don't know if there's another DVD out there. So, you know, as the only one in there, it's sort of like, okay, well, it's not perfect, but the story was really good. So, you know, it's it and it's the only thing that's out there, you know, and that that isn't an excuse for it not being quality because it is quality because I had Jason helping me. But I guess like I don't feel like I made mistakes with going cardboard, but what I learned from it was that like I said, don't do things solo. You need that other person, you need another voice, and I definitely that's why I didn't try to do shoot again by myself, you know, and try to do another one of these epic things which are very very difficult, you know, and the number of over like all nighter editing sessions I had to do and I wasn't even alone in going cardboard, but it was primarily, you know, I was calling the shots and I did cut together the first rough edit of the film, and that stuff was really hard. You know, what I'm doing differently in the case of Shoot Again is that, you know, I've got somebody who's really, really good at that, you know, in the primary position. You know, he's leading the project as opposed to the other way around, which is what it was with Going Cardboard, where I was cutting my teeth on this whole thing and leading the project. You know, and that worked out. But uh, I think for for uh, Shoot Again, this is working out perfectly. Seems like maybe you should have done things the other way, where you take a back seat to somebody else on your first time out, and then you step up to the plate. Yes, that that probably would have been, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty, that would have worked well. Except that I, there was nobody, you know, with going cardboard for that. Jason Scott had the expertise for editing, but there wasn't anybody that sort of saw the vision of that being a film. Um, in fact, one of the people I interviewed had said, oh, I thought about, you know, doing a film like this before. I don't think it's possible. And like someone else said, well, what happens if you don't finish it? And I was just like, don't finish it. Like, what are you talking about? That wasn't even like, you know, on my radar as an option. I'm like, I'm finishing it. So a lot of the times a project like this, like either one of these, any documentary, it boils down to all about drive. It's all about, you know, are you willing to just go at it until it's done and not give up for anything. And that is probably the most valuable uh, skill that you can have. It, you know, that, that makes up for a whole lot of other shortcomings. If you're just like, you've got the drive, you've got the ambition, you're like, I'm going to see this through because this is important and this is what I'm going to do. And I think that, that that's extremely valuable. Will Shoot Again be available on Blu-ray? That is up to Blake. I, I think that we can do that. I know Blu-ray is a little more complicated than DVD. I think there's some licensing issues that were why we didn't look at putting um, Going Cardboard on Blu-ray. But I, I think it's definitely possible. And if we do it, you know, it's certainly filmed in high enough depth that it could go on Blu-ray. So that'll be up to him. He may choose to do Blu-ray instead of DVD or I mean, maybe not DVD at all, but like I said, with all those bonus clips, I'm not sure what'll happen, because you can get Mario Warfare on DVD. Yes, in fact, I have my copy right here that I got through Kickstarter. Oh, fabulous. Very good. Yeah, it, it looks snazzy. I love that box. That's the other thing, too, when you have an actual physical copy, like the art, you know, and that's something we're kind of, you know, that was an era, you know, like um, album cover art that you don't really, I mean, you kind of get it. They still do album covers on like you know, Spotify, but it's not really the same. One of the things that's changed since Going Cardboard began is the proliferation of digital distribution. You mentioned that your previous film is available through Google Play and iTunes, but there are even more options available now, and they may not provide the bonuses and feelies that a physical copy does, but it seems like it's something that consumers really want, is to be able to stream their films and just own a file instead of a disc. So what options are you looking for with Shoot Again? Yeah, that is something that changed a lot. You know, I went through for going cardboard, I went through an aggregator, which at the time you kind of had to do, uh, which is how you, and pretty much if you're going to be on Netflix and so forth, you kind of have to do that anyway, because Netflix will not talk to you as an indie, you know, filmmaker one-on-one. -on -one. You have to go through an aggregator. I don't know how much iTunes is like that, but it probably is to a degree. But you know, pretty much right after I signed the contract, because there are exclusivity agreements, and I can't go to these things like, you know, the YouTube streaming or the Vimeo streaming, while I have, uh, you know, this contract with the aggregator. But 
that said, yes, those those options are good options now. And that's definitely what Blake plans to do. I think Vimeo is probably uh, what we're looking at. That said, I know that he and I both have plans for a lot of bonus material. So it depends on how we're going to handle that because he's got some really, really great bonus segments that aren't necessarily part of the main documentary that we want to share. So we have to figure out, you know, how to do that. But I'm sure there will be a way. The nice thing is there are, like you said, tons of options now. It's so much easier now. And people have moved away from the DVD platform now. And, you know, they kind of were at the time with going cardboard, like younger people. I've, you know, as an indie documentary fan, I've kind of held on to it because I like having those indie documentaries on my bookshelf. And even if you can get them digitally, especially with like things like bonus clips and, you know, director commentary and stuff, there's there's a lot of things a DVD can offer that's just really cool, and I, I like having the physical DVD. That said, I am starting to embrace, you know, the digital world. Like, I know we've talked about Steam and whatever and how I kind of stayed away from Steam. I was a late bloomer when it comes to Steam, but that was why. It was because I wanted that physical copy. I wanted that box, and so I wasn't really interested in Steam. And, you know, then there was, um, I was into MMOs, then... Uh, Oblivion came out, and I I was an Xbox gamer for years after that. I was like, oh yeah, go Xbox. And you know, I've kind of let that go over, now I'm a Steam gamer, so, but for a while, for a long, long while, I was into having to have that physical media. I want to talk to you a lot more about Steam, but first I have one more question about your documentaries. So between Going Cardboard and Shoot Again, you have conducted all these interviews, you've gone to conventions, you've done director Mm Q&A, and yet you claim to be an introvert. Oh yeah. How is it that you're getting up in front of all these people and talking in all these places in front of so many people, both one-on-one for interviews and large masses of hundreds of people, and yet you say you're an introvert? You know, because I'm a glutton for punishment, maybe. I don't know, because you're absolutely, like, totally right. I mean, I am nervous about this discussion, and we're friends, you know, and it's like just you and me, and we're just chatting, and that still makes me nervous. And, like, I get all, you can probably hear, like, I get the anxiety and whatever. Um, I'm totally comfortable with the fact that I'm an introvert. I don't like answering the phone at my office, you know, all that, the typical introvert things, partly because it's always telemarketers, you know, but, you know, I'm definitely an introvert. I've, I've read up a lot on this. Um, you know, there's the Susan Cain book, Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. I think what I've learned about introverts is that it's just the way some people are. They think better with quiet. They need you know, peaceful downtime to recharge and they can be incredibly creative, but you know, I'm not really a social butterfly. That said, I'm very creative and I like doing these things and like, I like making people happy. And when I see something like, you know, the board game community and they're such cool people and they're people like me and they have a really cool story, it kind of, I guess, is enough to push me over that fear And, you know, push me past, you know, okay, this makes me nervous as hell, but the, the need to do it and the desire to do it, like, you know, beats that. And that's kind of the way it is for me as an introvert. But yeah, I'm definitely, it makes me a lot more nervous to be on the other side of the camera than to be the one just asking the questions and making the other person like do all the stuff. So I guess with, with the documentaries and stuff, although, you know, times like PAX, like definitely make me nervous, but at the same time. They say that introverts um, can be totally passionate and enthusiastic about uh, topics that they care about, like topics that they're excited about. So with me, it's, you know, games, it's, it's, you know, the board games, it's pinball and stuff. Those are topics I know about, they're exciting to me. So kind of the introvert stuff falls away in situations like that. But like, you won't catch me like going out of my way to go to a party and small talk with strangers because it's just not my thing. Do you feel that we live in a society that stigmatizes being an introvert? Yeah, I mean, to a degree we do. I think we're maybe becoming more aware of it a little bit. But yeah, I mean, like everybody who is, you know, a really powerful talker, like, or or Hollywood people that are well-spoken, you know, like we, we idolize that. We idolize people that just like, you know, get it done and like, you know, ball busters and stuff. Like, we really do admire people like that. The quiet people. I mean, it's, it's human nature because it's harder 
to know how to react to somebody that's not an open book because you don't necessarily know what they're thinking. And I go through this at work a lot. You know, I have like upper management being like, well, I can never figure out what you're thinking, you know, and it's just like that only just makes me more like, you know, retreat and be like, oh, God, just leave me alone. You know, I think there is a stigma, but there are a lot of stigmas in our society. And we're doing our best to overcome those. But we are at the end of the day, still just people. And there's only so much you can do to fight, you know, nature. And I think as people, as more things happen, like more people talk about introverts, I think it's definitely becoming not exactly in fashion, but definitely more accepted that people have different styles and different ways of, you know, being ideal. Like, you know, I, there's nothing bad about somebody who's an open book in your face extrovert. That's great. And really society needs both types. But I think it, it's a matter of society kind of learning and appreciating that they do need both types. And, you know, people like designers and artists, it's much more forgiving in our society for them to be introverts, you know, inventors, stuff like that. I've read that Obama's an introvert, so he's good at making prepared speeches, but, you know, he has a lot of introvert qualities. So, you know, I, I think we try to learn to get along with everyone in society, but there's always going to be friction. Yeah, I think you've called yourself a functional introvert in the sense that you're able to get up and give these presentations. Yes. Yeah. And, and the thing about me is there's no amount of preparation that makes any of that easier because, you know, it's just not something I'm necessarily gifted at. So I just kind of do my best and go at it. And, you know, I'm not necessarily giving a better talk and presentation than someone who's more well-spoken is. But, you know, I still care about what I'm saying. And I think that that's just that makes the difference. Great. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about Steam. You said you were a late bloomer coming to that platform yeah. partly because you prefer to own the games. Was that the only thing keeping you away from Steam or was it more that you knew that you would be addicted as soon as you started? I no, it wasn't that it wasn't that like in hindsight, it should have been. But, um, you know, for a long time, like before the Xbox time, I was into MMOs, you know, I was like huge into Warcraft. Like I got my dream job, which was working at Turbine, you know, I got through MMOs through Asheron's Call. So I was into that. I was into Lord of the Rings Online, like just really, really into MMOs. And obviously Steam doesn't do those. So for me, it was kind of like, oh, whatever, you know, I'm spending all my time playing Lord of the Rings Online. Like, why would I need this other place where I can buy games? Or, you know, like, yeah, okay, I can buy Oblivion on Steam, but I'm playing it here on my Xbox, you know, in my bed. Like, it's really comfortable. Like, why would I want to you know, do that. So I guess I just didn't get it. Like, but I think that the rise of indie games kind of helped. But actually, the reason that I got into Steam, I remember the exact reason was because I wanted to play the DayZ mod. And the best way to do that was to get Arma 2 on Steam and do the mod from there. And that was actually the deciding factor why I finally went, oh, I have this Steam account, like, I need to actually use it for this. Fine, you know, I want to play Daisy so bad. So, you know, that was sort of like I, w I was forced to get into Steam. And then, you know, I started to buy, I can't remember what I bought after that, but then I started to become aware of Steam and my friends at work were like, oh, yeah, the fall sale's coming. And I'm like, what's the fall sale? You know, and, you know, famous last words, like, now I have like 115 games or something on Steam. I've played maybe, you know, 30 of them, but... You know, that's how Steam rolls. Get it? Steam rolls. Ah, oh, dear. <laughs> so you you play a lot of online games, including MMOs. Is there a particular guild or clan that you play with or against? Not really. Not anymore. I mean, I'm kind of out of my MMO phase. Not necessarily because I've switched it out for something that is more sensible, like, you know, shorter term games with a finite ending or anything like that, because I totally don't. Like, I've read these things on uh, the gaming sites, you know, like, oh, as like an adult with, you know, kids and a job and all these things, like I've realized like the best thing for me to do is play these games that take less time, you know, and games that have an ending and whatever. And I'm just like completely the opposite. I like, you know, online free world games. But that said, like, I don't do a lot of the MMOs anymore because they take a lot of coordination and my schedule just, you know, doesn't work with that. Like, I like solo games better or games like Hearthstone where, yeah, it's kind of multiplayer, it's online, but it's not like 
on a timetable. You don't, you're not scheduling raids or anything like that. But I like that because it works with my time more. So I do play online games as far as, you know, like I said, Hearthstone. I went back to WoW with the last expansion for briefly, but it's just, it's not the same for me anymore. So I guess I've moved on really from MMOs, although we did uh, over New Year's, like a couple of friends uh, and my husband and I did dive into Lord of the Rings online again um, because it's free to play and like, why not? You know, so that was fun. But for the most part, I- I'm playing single player games at this point. Such as this war of mine. You were a big fan of that game. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I'd been watching that game for like a year before it came out. Just when they first released the trailer, I was just like, wow, this is really cool. I'm really into survival games. And this war of mine is a survival game, but it's not about being, you know, in a war and being like the battlefield person. You're actually just a civilian. And I just thought that was such a neat, you know, and unique take on it. It just looked really interesting. So... Um, it did not disappoint. I got about 30 hours logged on this war of mine. I did complete it successfully, which is really, really hard to do. It's really challenging to actually get through the to the end of the war and have your guys survive. I had all but one of my guys survive. You know, the epilogues are really touching. It tells... They did such a great job. They give these profiles of the people that you're guiding to try to survive the war. And then at the end, they have the epilogues about what happened to them after the war. And it's just, they did such an amazing job. The art is so beautiful. Like everyone should play that game, but I still want to play it even after having, you know, finished it. So that's a testament to what a great job they did. I love that game. And also Far Cry 3. I'm giving myself carpal right now, trying to get through Far Cry 3. One of the things that you and I discussed a year or two ago when we started getting to know each other, and I, correct me if my memory is wrong, is we've always been talking about feminism and misogyny and sexism in the industry, Anita Sarkeesian, mm-hmm. Gamergate, and the like. But even well before that, when these topics first started coming up, when Anita Sarkeesian first went on Kickstarter, if I recall correctly, you were sort of surprised that this level of misogyny exists in the game industry, which implies to me that you had never experienced it yourself, which surprised me if you're going online and playing Asheron's Call and World of Warcraft. I've heard stories about women who feel the need to use a different gender for their character because they they don't want people finding out that they're playing with a woman because as soon as they find out, they get treated differently. Has that not been your experience? Yeah, this has been kind of an eye-opener of a year for me in that sense because weirdly, yes, most of my life I did not run into those issues. And, you know, I would frequently play a male character in the MMOs that I would play, but it wasn't because I was hiding or anything. I just thought they looked cooler. Like, you know, in like uh, Diablo 2, I played as the Barbarian just because... You know, it was like this Conan style thing, and I liked it. You know, in Asheron's Call 2, I played as a male Tumorok just because they looked cooler. Like, they were big and whatever. And I think, like, anyone who looks at the gender of an avatar and thinks they're actually talking to a woman is generally sorely mistaken. So, you know, like, I would never choose to play a male or female avatar because of that. However, um, you know, and, and also, like, when I used to play Magic the Gathering in physical situations... Uh, back in the 90s, I was used to being like the only female in a room full of guys. And they didn't like I was never picked on like it wasn't like that, you know, and it just I mean, I definitely wanted to prove myself and wanted to be good at those games and, you know, make a good showing. And I, I did decently. But if anything, like people were appreciative of my even being there of like my even being into the game. So it was really kind of and the classic gaming seen as the same way you know and when i would go up to like fun spot and like the king of kong guys were there every single one of them was just they wouldn't necessarily know how to um properly you know converse with women they don't always but you know any geek is like that or has the potential to be like that but there was nobody that was like offensive like you know i always felt welcomed in those situations you know so it was weird to me like when people started talking about oh you know sexism and like like online games like people guys are being like horrible and rude and whatever to females i'm just like why would they do that that this makes no sense to me so it was a long time before i actually experienced it myself but i did um, i was playing i think a couple years ago a game called nether which is um a first person kind of survival shooter game. Like you're up against aliens in this like ruined city and you're running around and it's a really cool game. And it's definitely an adrenaline game. And I, I love it. So I'm there like running around and 
the thing that changed everything, I guess, is the audio part. Because, you know, I'm typing in text, like someone's like, oh, women don't play these games. And I was like, well, I'm a woman. And first of all, they didn't believe me in the text. And then, you know, they said something very rude, just out of nowhere, just like, well, women are like unicorns, except unicorns are good looking or beautiful or something like that. And, you know, I'm like 40 years old. I just kind of like rolled my eyes and like, whatever. But, you know, if I'd been like a 14 year old girl trying to get into these games and feeling kind of intimidated already, that probably would have been really hurtful. So it was just weird to me. I'm like, why? Again, I still don't understand why you would, that would be your leading thing is to try to tear down someone immediately if you think they're female. So that was kind of unsettling, but I guess the game sort of redeemed itself later in another play session because I was, I grouped up with these other two guys and we were doing this mission, like there's a safe zone and you have to like, um, you know, sometimes the safe zone will get attacked by the aliens and you have to like take down you know, re repair some stuff. I forget it's been a while at these different points in it to secure the safe zone. So we're all going around and, you know, I was definitely pulling my weight and I, they definitely could not have secured the safe zone without my contribution. So we finished it. We did it. It was a nail biter. And the three of us met up and we were all kind of like happy and celebrating. And the guy dropped something for me. Like he was dropping health kits for the other two of us. And I hit the V key, which is how you chat. And I said, thank you. And both of them just like, freak, they went, you're a girl? Like they totally wigged out about it. And I'm like, yeah. But the difference here was they were like, oh, you want to go on a mission? Let's get you geared up. Like, let's, you know, let's, let's go play together after this uh, battle. So we did. And so I guess maybe it just depends on the people that you're playing with at the time. There's definitely that animosity out there. But there are good people out there, too. So, I don't know. I, I still just, I can't understand it at all why people are so hateful in that situation, other than they're just feeling threatened. And the only thing you can do, it's like this guy, Prince E, that I listen to a lot, his very inspiring videos, you know, he says, react with react to hatred and all that with kind of compassion and try to be understanding. And, you know, what else can you do? If you react by being hateful back at them, you're just going to escalate it. But, you know, like I said, the, I've seen the sexism now. I've seen some of the misogyny. But I've also seen the good side. Well, I'm glad that's been your experience. This concept of gatekeeping has never really made sense to me because I grew up in a very small community and there was not a lot of diversity in it. And that meant that there also weren't a lot of people who liked video games as much as I did. So I ended up playing one player mode more often than not. And I would have loved to have somebody else to play with, whether it was, you know, a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, it didn't matter. And especially right. now, you know, the more kinds of people you have to play with, the more people you have to play with. Right. It's like, why should it matter? Right. I mean, I want everybody to be into my hobby. So why would I ever tell somebody no for something as superficial as their gender? It's weird. And then there's that whole thing. I think kind of before the sexism part, I, I found about this whole like fake uh, geek thing where it's like, you know, people will grill women about their comic book knowledge because they can't possibly be actual comic book fans and stuff. And it's just strange. I even got that myself the other day when I unboxed a loot crate on YouTube. Somebody said, you've never read a comic book in your life, have you? And I'm like, w w what does that even matter? What does that have to do with anything? Right. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I could go take a picture of my 3,000 comic books, but I really don't have any desire to prove this to you. So I just said, go away. Right. So that's the thing. You know, what, what really interests me is the psychology. It's like, why? The why? Like, why are they doing that? You know, why are we so cynical? as a society that like we'd rather somebody not be into what we're into than be enthusiastic about what we're into. Like, why wouldn't we want that? So it's, it is weird. The only thing I can think of is what TJ said on the most recent episode of Polygamer, where those who were bullied growing up grew up to be bullies. And so I imagine that mm -hmm. some people felt like they were excluded as kids that, you know, me, for example, I was always picked last for the sports games and the mm -hmm. various team captains would never me choose too. me first. Right. See? And so now it, now that we have an expertise in something, whether it's gaming or documentary making or whatever, it's our opportunity to turn around and be the gatekeepers and say, no, I'm going to pick you last because I'm first. But even though I understand that's the reason, it's not the excuse. It still doesn't make sense. No, but yeah, I think 
that, that there's probably a lot of truth to that, you know, and the people who grew up as geeks and being picked on for being geeks, I mean, there is resentment and that's understandable. And it's like I've said before, human nature to kind of take that out on people. But I don't know, there's so much of it. It's, it doesn't even feel like it's necessarily that. And like you said, that's not an excuse. We should be open and excited about anyone who wants to be friends and, you know, be part of our geek culture. Like, I just, I don't know why people aren't, but there's got, we have to figure out the why of that because we're never going to solve it, like, by logically arguing with them. It, obviously, the Gamergate thing proved that. Well, fortunately, you're doing your part to expand the geek community by raising the next generation. You are raising two gamers of your own. Yep, yep. And do you, do you play board games, pinball games, video games with them? Well, they don't like the pinball as much as we'd like them to, but, you know, you can lead a horse to water. So that's the one thing as a geek parent, not pushing your kids to like the specific thing you like is super important. You know, although my daughter liked the ACDC pinball, and I'm just so proud of that, you know, because there's always these discussions on the pinball forums about what theme would be good if I'm trying to get my wife into pinball. And that drives me nuts because I'm just like, it's not about the theme. It doesn't have to be some like little girly you know, like Hello Kitty pinball if they're a girl, you know, like I, I like the stuff that's just as rough and tumble as the guys, except for maybe like the Playboy pinball machine. Like, okay, you know, I'm not into that, but it's not, if it was a stunning, great example of pinball, I wouldn't, you know, like turn away from it just because it was Playboy. Like, I don't care. I care that it's a good game, but um, so yeah, we, we would like them to be more into pinball, but they're super into video games. Even my daughter, you know, and that I'm very aware of that, and I'm watching that unfold because I don't want to push her into, you know, not liking the pink aisle at Target, but at the same time, the pink aisle at Target really drives me crazy. So, you know, you have to let them evolve how they're going to evolve, but my son is a hardcore gamer, and my daughter, you know, they both play Tomodachi Life, they both play Animal Crossing, you know, she's she's got her own uh, 3DS, so she's as much a gamer as she wants to be, and that's what I care about. But yeah, they play board games with us. Like it was, um, they've requested to play board games with us. And my son and I play lots of video games together. And the two of them play video games together. So I, I think it's just a giant game fest. And it's awesome. Are they playing Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> no. Actually, uh, as we were talking, my son is playing Castle Crashers um, right now. Uh, that's the other thing where it's like we're eager for them to play kind of grown-up games but you know we do understand they can't play games like that um so you have to self-regulate a little bit minecraft is like you know there's i would never tell a kid not to play minecraft i mean the the amount that they learn about physics and you know he knows more about a lot of he, he was he knew p the word parkour a lot sooner than i did growing up because of minecraft so you know, games like that at his birthday party, which was a Minecraft themed birthday party. He and his three fl friends played Towerfall Ascension on the PlayStation and they were just like screaming with laughter. They had such a good time. As far as the edgy end of things, I do play Seven Days to Die with him. And I've come across some degree of criticism before, like, oh, that's too mature a game for, you know, kids. But that's not really the way he looks at it. It does have some blood and gore, but. You know, our kids get exposed to that in movies and TV a lot more than we did. So, you know, it's not necessarily good that they're desensitized to that. But I, I do not ever underestimate what kids are capable of. I let them choose for themselves, like, you know, what they can handle. But for him, Seven Days to Die is just sort of an extension of Minecraft because they're both voxel based. It's just more survivally and he's good at it. And we, and it's his chance to play together with me. So it's really special for us. But if he was having nightmares over it, I wouldn't be playing it with him. Now, you not only play games together, you also record some YouTube videos with your kids, don't you? Yes. Well, yeah, one time he and his sister were playing Seven Days to Die and they were hysterical. So I just started streaming it because they were so funny, just the things they were saying. And um, back when I was trying to play Elite Dangerous... This happens all the time that I'll start playing a game like Sims 4 or Elite Dangerous, and they'll just commandeer my computer completely and just start playing it themselves. And I'm like, okay. But like Elite Dangerous, like when they started like being pilot and co-pilot, like I streamed that because it was just funny as hell. So yeah, I definitely do videos 
from time to time with them. Partly because I think it'll be super awesome when they're, you know, 14 or 16 or, you know, on their first date to, like, whip that out. You know, it's like the, the new, like, baby pictures. Like, show those little videos because they're, they're priceless. You know, things have changed a lot since I was that age because video games did not make me popular or more date-worthy when I was a kid. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, everything's changed. You're raising this next generation of geeks. You're shooting a documentary with one already under your belt. You're playing Steam games all the time. You have a full-time job. I don't understand how you juggle it all. I mean, you and I often call each other the most productive people we know, but everything yeah. I do, I do without raising a family, and I can't imagine raising a family on top of everything else I do. So how do you maintain so many hobbies while also being a parent? I don't know, really. I mean... You know, it's like in generations when Scotty goes like, if something's important, you make time, whatever, you know, I mean, that's true to a degree. Like, I've read lots of articles on LinkedIn about how as a society, we feel like we don't have any free time. But then if you break it down and look like we're spending what, like six hours a day watching television, you know, and so forth and or browsing Facebook, which is ironic for me to say, since I am a social media manager, but we waste tons of time texting, browsing Facebook and Twitter, you know, all that stuff. If we, if there's something we really want to do, there's plenty of free time to be had in most cases. It's a matter of, you know, being aware of that and taking the time when you can. So like games like Seven Days to Die, which I keep bringing up, but it is one of my favorites. It was one of the best Kickstarters I ever back. And those guys, uh, the fun pimps are just insane about updates like it's over a year later and they're still rolling out the updates the kudos to those guys they're awesome you know a game like that which has a day and night cycle and you're holed up in your little base like at night and if you move around they're going to hear you it's a really good there is downtime in that and it's a really good opportunity for me to go in the basement get the laundry bring it back up and fold it while I'm waiting for this you know night to be over for example so you know I'm getting two things done right then or, you know, loading the dishwasher or whatever. So that doesn't happen most of the time. But um, if you want to make time for things, you can. And besides, you, I'm not running, like, these awesome, like, podcasts like you are right now. I'm sort of in a project in between things. So, you know, if you were wasting all your time playing video games, instead of doing podcast interviews, you'd play more, too, you know. <laughs> um, but, and I think that's fine. There's ebb and flow to the creative process versus the consuming process. So I'm consuming other people's cool creative, you know, creations now. But, you know, who knows what I'll be doing next, you know, and partly because I wasn't doing that during the time when I was doing my part in the pinball documentary, you know, when I was coordinating interviews and all that stuff and like writing the outline and writing the interview questions, I wasn't gaming as much. So, you know, it comes and goes. But right now, you know, Blake's editing the film. So, you know, I'm reviewing clips and rough cuts and stuff. I'm I'm still active in that. But, you know, on a Saturday morning when we're bumming around the house and it's freezing outside, you know, I'm not taking the kids, you know, off to the local farm like I do in the summer. So it leaves me with plenty of time. So I guess bottom line, it's just, you know, managing your own time. And if you really want to do something, you'll find time. I mean, in addition, to, I, I probably do game too much. But, you know, in addition to doing it, um, there, there are other hobbies I do. Like, I'm working on fermenting. Like, I'm trying to get pickling to work, um, which has been challenging. And games are more rewarding because I'm better at that. But, uh, you know, there will be times, like, on a Saturday night when my husband's playing Shadows of Mordor. My son's watching him. My daughter's, like, you know, either on her DS or watching YouTube. And I'm playing, you know, I was playing Far Cry. And, you know, we're all doing different things, but we're all in the same room. And it, it does feel like a family thing at that point. So I typically don't game when the whole family's here. But, you know, sometimes I do. You mentioned that people who may not be as productive or as creative as we are may instead be watching six hours of television a day. And it didn't occur to me until just now that in the years that you and I have been exchanging emails, Facebook posts, tweets... I don't think we've ever once discussed our favorite TV shows, uh, not counting historical examples like Star Trek and Quantum right. Leap, but I've, ne okay. I've never heard you talk about Dexter or Breaking Bad or CSI. Do you even watch television? Oh, that is true. Um, no, I do. I, I watch a good amount of it, 
And Dexter was like a huge favorite of mine. I love Dexter until the final episode, but we won't get into that. I am not watching like Game of Thrones. I like it, but I just, it's one of those things. We are super into like, you know, our guilty pleasure is the, the Alaska reality TV shows. So we will always catch Gold Rush and we will always catch, you know, a lot of those. There's uh, Edge of Alaska, I think, is the new one that's really interesting about this, like, little tiny town where they don't even, you know, have reliable electricity up in Alaska. And it's just, you know, those kind of stories that is sort of like documentary, you know, but there was a cool book about stuff that happened in that town. So I got the book. So these have positive sides, you know, now I'm reading this book, but um, oh, and on Netflix, you know, that's the other thing. We're watching Death Note right now, the, the anime series. So that's something we do as a family. But in general, I'm not as into TV as, you know, a lot of my friends. Like, our friends are watching Big Bang Theory and stuff. And, and I never, we never, like, Walking Dead, obviously, we're watching because I love that show to death. But we never watch these things live. We always DVR them. And we always kind of watch them as time allows. So I guess... That's part of it, but yeah, for me, I'm way more passionate about games than TV. Except that there is a Walking Dead pinball machine, and I really super want it, so we, the husband and I have to have that discussion. And as soon as you have that discussion and you add it to your collection, I hope you'll invite me up to play it. You, absolutely, absolutely. I will keep you posted when that's there. It's supposed to be really good, too. And they just announced the premium model. Excellent. So hopefully, hopefully we'll get that. I look forward to you getting your hands on it. Hey, me too. <laughs> Well, oh, thank you so much. We've covered so much ground today. I really appreciate it. Is there anything that we haven't covered? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I could talk about games like all day. There was this other game, um, Words for Evil, that I did want to mention because um, a friend of mine uh, runs this little gamer cast called uh, Frame Loss, and he told me about this game, and it's, like, adorable, and it's this, like, retro-y thing, and, you know, I was always into, like, Bookworm and those spelling games. This is really cool. It's on Steam, so I would give a little shout-out to that. But, um, yeah, other than that, I think the big takeaways are just, you know, manage your time and, like, don't let anything stop you if you have a project you want to do. And, you know, game with your kids because it's the best way to understand gaming. And let's all just get along. And bring your kids to Star Trek conventions. That's where I last uh, saw you. That was so much fun. Yeah, they had a blast. That was a bucket list. I wanted to go to a Star Trek convention. So we've done that. They had fun. Well, I will include links to all these items that you mentioned in the show notes, as well as where our listeners can find you online. Where would that be? Oh, um, well, I'm on Twitter as at Lorian Green, and um, you can you can visit the website for the movie at shootagainpinballmovie.com. Uh, also, goingcardboard.com for the for that documentary. We the website for Shoot Again is in sore need of an update. That's basically my fault. I will get that updated, but we generally post on the Facebook group uh, updates for that. But uh, that is definitely in the works. And uh, usually when you're in the editing phase of a film, it goes into silent running. And that's basically the thing you need to be aware of in battle. So we're in silent running now, but, you know, we're like a duck. We're paddling like crazy underneath. So those would be the main places. And we can look forward to seeing that documentary later in 2015, I hope. Definitely in 2015, hopefully soon. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Laurie. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you, Ken. It's always a pleasure. This has been Polygamer, a GameBits production. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback at polygamer.net. Yeah, so I don't know if you've seen this guy, but his name is DJ Wheat, and I guess, like, the same guy that does the Frame Loss podcast from my work, he uh, knows the guy. He does the most adorable videos with his son. Like, he calls his son Mini Wheat, and they are so cute. So I take kind of inspiration and, you know, solace in the fact that other people have the, the guts to do that, because you want to share that, you know? Yeah, anyway...